Okay, good. Now I can tell my story. Um, William Gossett was a hotshot uh, uh, statistical uh, uh, student from Oxford, and he was hired by the Guinness Brewing Company to um, uh, employ statistical testing for quality improvement for brewing um, probably Guinness um, stouts. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the, the Guinness Company didn't want any of its competitors to know that it was using a secret weapon, statistics, in doing its quality improvement or quality control. So it forbade um, Gossett from publishing. So he, he decided to publish under a pseudonym. And he happened to be a, a student of a famous um, uh, statistician called Carl Pearson. And he, instead of calling himself Pearson, you know, basically he just called himself student. He was very modest. And in fact, most of the, uh, most of the time you see um, student in, in lowercase. So he was very modest. But basically, you know, originally this, was, uh, this whole idea was kind of like to figure out what the sm what's the smallest sample uh, you need to make sure that you've got a, a reliable a set of measurements from a vat of, uh, of Guinness stout, okay? And probably also it's like, you know, to minimize the chance that the guys testing it out would get drunk. So. Um, this basically represents a situation where um, there's not much likelihood there is between there of a difference between two groups. And in fact, there probably is no difference here because I purposely made these two groups have the same mean. Okay, so if you um, employed the um, formula that I gave you about two slides ago, or if you went to um, this um, um, website at the top, um, you could actually calculate the t-test based on the means, the standard deviations, and the, uh, the um, number of people in each group. And basically what you find is that the t-test itself is equal to zero. And then and that the probability, well, if the t-test is zero, what do you think the probability is in this case? Anyone? One. Mm -hmm. So the same mean, t-test is zero. There's absolute certainty these, t these two groups still come from the same population. Okay, and then you conclude basically that there, is there a significant difference or is there not a significant difference? Anyone? Did I say not? Okay. So there's no significant difference between these groups because basically uh, a probability of one is way above point zero, point, uh, zero 0.05 and so there's no significant difference here at all. Okay. So here's another example where I think there's, there's a good chance there's a significant difference between these two groups. It's like a weir, really, really big difference between these two groups and very little overlap. So basically, uh, I'm not expecting anyone to do the calculations here. T-test is 8.98. The probability or the p-value of this t-test is less than 0 0.001. So what will we conclude? OK, right. Well, first of all, there's a significant difference. The two groups are different. And so basically, if this were an analgesic or some sort of drug that is supposed to, be to lower some outcome in, uh, in a group, then basically you conclude, yeah, it's effective. Okay. Let's try this one. Well, just by eyeballing this, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you can really tell. I mean, there's a lot of, there's more overlap. Uh, there's a smaller difference between the two groups. And so let's just see. Here's the t-test where there's less certainty. The mean for one group is 5.5. The mean for the other one is 6.5. So there's only like one point difference between the two groups. Standard deviation is 1.25. The n, the same for both groups. The t-test is 2.99. And just kind of a hint, um, if your, um, your sample size is like 28 or above, um, a t-test of two or, ab or above is going to give you significance. So I just kind of blabbed it out. So what do you think the conclusion is? All right, I'm hearing the mumbling. I'm hoping it's saying, yeah, there's a significant difference here. And in fact, the p-value is 0 0.004. And yeah, there's a significant difference here. It's less than the, um, than the point of no return, that significance level of 0 0.05. Okay, and we conclude, basically, there's a significant difference that, that, that this drug, whatever we're testing, uh, is lowering the, um, the score for the, um, the active group. And so basically, it, it's, it's showing effectiveness. OK. Um, I don't want to go back to the formula, but just try to imagine um, what would happen if the, well, we just saw what happens to the t-test if the differences are larger. If the differences are larger, everything else being the same, 
what happens to the T test? Get smaller or larger? Okay. What happens if the standard deviations get smaller? Uh huh. Yeah. So standard deviation is in the denominator. If the standard deviations become larger, the denominator becomes larger, so the overall value becomes larger. Okay? So anytime your denominator becomes larger, you're going to have a, a higher t test or a higher statistic in general. Okay? And so what happens if the sample sizes become larger? Okay. Um, the sample sizes, the sample sizes, the sample size goes into the, to the denominator. It means the denominator is going to get larger, so it means the t-test is going to become larger. The reason why I mention this is that probably the, um, the means and the standard devi deviations really aren't in your control, but one thing you can control is your sample size. So it's always important to try to get a large enough sample size so you have a good chance of uh, finding a significant difference. And this is called basically uh, this is basically called having power to find a significant difference. And uh, Patricia Friedman, who's sitting in the, the audience, will be talking about this in the next lesson. But just kind of like you know, give you an idea of um, the importance of um, having a large enough sample so you have uh, a good chance of finding a significant difference between your groups. Yeah, well, you can do that. So in other words, anytime you can reduce the variability, and so that you know that that comes in with things like um, 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 having exclusion criteria, um, or being very careful about doing your measurements. So you know, basically, you know, you don't. Uh, I've seen um, um, diastolic blood pressures of 590, for example. That kind of messes up your your standard deviations a lot. So you know, it's 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 being reliable. It's being accurate. It's also kind of seeing what things might be influential in making more variability in your groups and, and possibly excluding people who are going to um, result in larger variability in your groups. And that's something that's legitimate given the fact that a lot of times, you know, when you're doing, you're testing out a new drug, you want to make things a little bit easier to find a significant difference. And then when you, if you find a significant difference, say in a phase two trial, you, you then try to expand the, uh, you know, the criteria for including people. So basically, yeah, there, uh, there, there are other ways of manipulating the standard deviation, but I, I think I'll leave that to, uh, um, I think there's another lesson on basically designing clinical trials. Um, okay, let's go on and talk about the dependent sample t-test. Um, this is what you get when you have a situation where you have the same group tested twice, so a before and after situation. Um, so for example, we could have instead of like two separate groups, one getting the active and one getting the placebo, you could have the same group and you could have them first on the placebo or you could have them first um, randomly assigned to um, placebo or to active and then you'd maybe have a washout period and then you'd have the second phase where the, fi the, the people who got placebo would now get, get the active drug or the people who got the active drug would now get placebo. So that's a before and after design. And it's also referred to as a correlated samples design, a paired samples design, a repeated measure. So all these basically mean the same thing. Um, here's the formula for this. And believe it or not, it does look pretty much like the t-test for two dependent groups. The new thing is, uh, let's see if I can drag them. There we go. OK. The new thing is this. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but the R with subscript 1, 2 is basically the correlation coefficient between the two groups. Correlation, I'm talking about in another lesson, but basically it's a measurement of how much relationship there is between your two groups, or how much of a linear relationship there is. So what happens when you have, if you can, the advantage of having a correlated samples t-test is that notice that this component is being subtracted from the denominator. It's going to make your denominator um, sure. 
Yeah, so the denominator is going to become smaller. Okay, denominator is going to, I did this right. So the denominator is going to become smaller, so that's going to result in, what's going to happen to your t-test? Okay, so the t-test is going to become larger. So one of the advantages of doing this kind of design and using a pair of t-tests is that you're more likely to, ha you're, you're going to have a hot larger t-test value, and you're more likely to get a significant uh, difference. Okay? Yeah. Okay, well, um, it's a separate lesson, but basically you're going to have, um, in this kind of um, design, you're going to have people with paired scores. So you're going to have people who have a score from the before phase and from the, the after phase. And so what you can do is you can compare their, um, their, their pain scores from the before phase versus their, their after phase, and you can figure out what the, um, you know, if, if you actually graph them, You'd actually you, you tend to see that there's a relationship that the people who had a low pain score uh, before will also have a low pain score after. And same thing for people with a high pain score. They'll also tend to be consistent. They'll also tend to have a high pain score after. But basically, everyone's going to maybe be uh, they're going to be re reduced kind of in the, uh, to the same degree. So the people who are low before are still going to be low, but they're going to be also going to be lowered by the amount of uh, how much the treatment works. Right? So basically, you're gonna, um, you can actually figure out what the, the linear relationship is between the two sets of measurements, and that's, and that's what the uh, correlation coefficient is. And that can range from minus 1 to plus 1. And so the higher that is, the, um, 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 the, the higher that is, the more of a linear relationship there is between your two groups. And likewise, when you put that into your um, uh, t-test for dependent samples, it's going to reduce your denominator, and so basically your t-test is going to be higher. Okay. So basically, the denominator usually measures random variability, just how much people within a group vary from one another. If you can show that there's a correlation between how they did before versus after, that's no longer random because you've got a correlation. So basically the rationale is that if you find that the, if you can figure out what the correlation is, you can subtract that from your denominator because something that's correlated means it's no longer random. So the basically you're allowed, you know, by the rules, anything that isn't random you can take out of the formula. So the result is that you've got a smaller um, denominator and a higher um, t-test overall. Excuse me. Yeah. Graphically, is no, um, no th th what would be identifying the overlap would be the standard deviations that are still in that formula. Okay. So basically, you've still got the overlap, and you're reducing the amount of overlap by how much of the variability you can explain with the, the, with the correlation. So it's, it's actually two parts. One is the still the variability. The other part is, okay, is there some variability that we can explain through the correlation? If we can explain, uh, um, whatever we can explain through the correlation, we just drop, we, 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 we take out from the denominator. Okay. Um, I work with endocrinology, so um, here's an example that I have basically from them. Um, we've got a group of uh, four diabetic patients who are measured for... Um, hemoglobin A1C, which is usually a marker for uh, nephritic health or um, kidney function. And so um, they're measured before and after undergoing an education program to help modify their eating habits and, uh, and ex encourage them to, to exercise. And what you hope is the A1C value will go down as a result of the intervention. So the, um, the pre-mean A1C is 8.78, the post is 7.84. Standard deviations are 1.01 and, and 1.10. The correlation in this case is 0.45, and the n is 4. Okay. 